Welcome to the basic module of Advanced and Wireless Communications. This course is part of the Colibri project and my name is Andreas Timgiel. I'm with Hamburg University of Technology. If we talk about wireless communications, um, the main thing we have to discuss and consider and understand is the radio propagation. If we talk about radio propagation, firstly we can start with a simple where we just say we have just a transmitter with an antenna which is transmitting in all directions with the same power and we have one receiver, we don't have anything in the environment, no reflections, no transmissions to obstacles, nothing like this. Even if we start like this, we see that um, if we radiate the power fr um, from this um, antenna in all directions, same, we basically have a sphere and the power is distributed over the surface of the sphere. The surface of the sphere itself is increasing with the square of the distance, which means the power density is decreasing with the square of the distance. And that is the first problem, so we have a strong um, decrease of power over the distance. And the second thing is that it also is depending on the frequency. The higher the frequency is, the less power you can get out of the same area in um, the surface of the sphere. Um, and if you see it that in a mathematical equation, we see that the received power we see on the right on the picture is um, equaling the transmitted power. We have the square of the, um, of the lambda, which is um, depending on the frequency, and we have um, the distance in this term, and then we have the gains of the antennas of transmitter and receiver. This is, of course, not reality. This is the ideal case. If we talk about the reality, we have to add things like shadowing, which means someone is running in front of the antenna or in front of the receive antenna, somewhere in the middle of the field. We talk about um, refraction, um, if you have to transmit through a wall, through some material, um, you have a refraction, you change the direction of the, di of the um, transmission, you reduce the power of the transmitted wave. We talk about scattering, if you, uh, if you hit an edge of an obstacle, you, you start again with um, a lot of waves coming to the different directions. We talk about diffraction at corners and edges, and it, all these effects are depending on the frequency. The higher the frequency is, the more we are coming similar to a visible light, and the lower the frequency is, the stronger the effects of diffraction of, um, of, yeah, of, of diffraction in particular are, which means you can also better travel around the um, around corners, and also the better, the lower the frequency is, the better we can transmit into medium. If you look at the path loss then, um, you can, um, on one side, um, this is a typical um, path loss. This would be the free space loss. You see if you do it on a logarith logarithmic scale, we see that uh, we have a strong decrease in the beginning and then um, it is not, well, it's, it's, it just goes down with d squared, what, what you've seen in the equation. If you have to consider all the transmissions to walls and media, if you have to trans think about all the reflections, um, there are a lot of measurements and we have a number of empirical models which are based off a massive amount of measurements and then uh, you would um, replace this factor of d square or the, the square of the distance by another factor like three or four or five depending on the environment you have. And then you have something uh, which is um, giving you the average received power, nothing more than this. We have to consider more and this more and um, one of the worst things we have is the multipass propagation. It's easily explained. Um, we have a transmitter and we have a receiver here and we have of course, or not of course, but in this case we have a direct line of sight. So some of the part of the signal is transmitting directly from transmitter to receiver. But we also have reflections at buildings or um, traffic signs or lorries which are passing by. And all these different waves superimpose. And what we see here is we have the signal at the uh, transmitter. So we transmit at T1, um, the blue one, and we transmit at T2, the um, green one, and we receive the blue one at T1 plus tau, which is um, the propagation delay, and we receive a lot of reflections. And then sometime later, we receive the second transmitted data, or sec the second impulse in this case, and all the reflections. This we call an impulse response if the data transmitted data is an impulse and it characterizes the channel. And you can easily see on Im in, uh, imagine that if we transmit very fast, after each other, then um, these reflections will interfere with the next symbol. And that's what we see on the next side. Next slide. So if we transmit very slowly, everything is fine. Uh, we transmit, we get all the reflections, our receiver has to make sure that we superimpose them in the right way. And if we um, do it very quickly, 
we see that um, the uh, reflections of the first symbol is interfering with the um, direct component of the second symbol. This causes a lot of problems. But even, let's just um, think about even this, if we see if, uh, the, um, if we can resolve the different paths or not depends on the frequency of the receiver. And if we have to superimpose them, if they have a different phase, they would just cancel out. Uh, so um, that might cause big problems. You see that if you have a car and you listen to the radio, if you're in front of a traffic light and the signal is very bad, you move half a wavelength, then you come from a cancellation to superimposition, and then you can receive your favorite station again. Okay. Um, this is all already happening in the static channel, and the mobility gives us even more problems. So if we think about that uh, we move, the channel changes over time and location, and also the signal paths change, and we have different delay variations of different signal paths. And then we might even have different phases of different signal paths. They are all superimposed, and we have a very high fluctuation. And um, what you see here is um, on this slide, we have um, on one side, we have, of course, the, um, the path loss, the free space loss, which we have, or depending on how many shadowing you have. If you have, over time, another shadow are coming in, which means a person moving in the field, for example, then you have um, attenuation, which you see in the blue line. And around this, you would have all the reflections which superimpose or cancel out in, in, uh, in a complex way. And we call this one the fast fading, which is um, due to the multipath components, or we call the slow fading, the fading which is due to the obstacles. And so you can imagine that we have a very complex environment and it's very difficult to guarantee some, um, some signal to be received because what we have seen also in the introduction, you can have up to 30 dB um, cancellation or um, fading from just from superimposing wave components which are similarly strong but um, phase shifted. So if you look, look into the problem of wireless communication, we have the different interferences. I, um, I already told um, or explained the intersymbol interferences, which is um, due to the delayed multipath components, which interfere with subsequent symbols. We also have multiple access interferences, which means different users interfere with each other, which depend on the access scheme. So if you have um, um, a time synchronization where you have different time starts, if, that's not, uh, if you're not 100% accurately uh, synchronized, you might have some interference with the next time slot. Or if you are doing frequency division multiple access, you might interfere with the next frequency. We also have some interference um, inside a cell. We call it intracell interference. That means um, interference between different users of the same cell. And we might have interference between different cells. So interference users of neighboring cells when you remember the different frequencies we have seen um, in the cellular use, you might um, think about that something like in a distance of three or four cells, you reuse the same frequency. If you are somewhere on a mountain and um, you have some certain provocation characters, you might just interfere with, uh, with the, not with the next cell, but three cells further. How can we combat the different interferences? I want to give you the example of the intersymbol interferences. Um, one thing is what you can do is you can create very complex receiver structures which um, identify the different paths and, and work against it. Um, this is one thing you can do and it's often, often done. Um, the other thing you can do is to reduce the data rate, of course, which sounds uh, maybe stupid in the beginning, but I will explain how you can make use of it. So if you remember some slides ago, we discussed about the signals, uh, the um, received signal. You rec we have this first part, uh, the first symbol, we have the second symbol. If um, the reflections of the first um, transmitted signal are interfering with the second symbol, then we have this intersymbol interferences. If we transmit slower, we have more time in between the different signals sent, then everything is fine. What you ca then can do is, um, of course, you can transmit several on several frequencies at the same time, and then you would uh, be able to transmit on each of the frequencies in a lower um, data rate, and then you don't have the intersymbol interference. But typically you buy this for the price that if you look at the frequency domain, which we have on the bottom here, then um, typically you need some kind of a guard band in between the different transmitted um, signals in the different frequency bands. And if you make or modify the different transmitted signals in a smart way that they're orthogonal to each other, they don't interfere and you don't need a guard band. And that's what we do with 
orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, and that is the scheme which is mainly used in all the advanced and um, um, high-speed data uh, mobile data systems we are using at the moment, like wireless LAN, like LTE. They are all using OFDM technology. Looking further to the different interferences, um, what is important at the receiver is how much signal do I get in relation to the interference and the noise. So we, are, we have to look into the signal to interference plus noise ratio, um, which is I'm giving this equation here. So the, um, it is the signal which we receive, that is uh, the signal which is transmitted minus the f um, space loss or free space loss or the intonation which was um, observed over the channel. And we have some noise flow, of course, and we have interference from a number, k number of different interferers. And this has to be good enough to receive the signal, and it depends very much on the mobile radio system which you're using. So if you use um, LTE, which is using OFDM, we need, um, for an excellent quality of service, we need something like 20 dB or more. Uh, we might have some good um, reception, and we can use according modulation coding schemes if we have um, between 20, 10 and 20 dB. And um, say, if you go below this 0 dB, then we have a real problem to receive the signal. If you use wideband CDMA and spread over the signal, we could even live with very low data, um, signal to noise ratios, even below 0 dB. If you think about what kind of data do we get over the channel, it's the next question. And there was a, a theorem from Shannon Hartley, which is still valid. Um, it is basically saying that uh, the capacity of a channel, the ideal capacity can be uh, can reach, is um, depending on the bandwidth and the signal to noise ratio. Uh, it's giving you the upper bound of the throughput you can get over a noisy channel. The error rate which you have is inverse is reverse or inverse proportional to the signal to noise ratio, of course, and this is also why the capacity be, um, depends on the signal to noise ratio. If you look for very high signal to noise ratios, uh, you can simplify this equation saying and then it ends up with something like the capacity is one third of the bandwidth times the signal to noise ratio in dB. And um, let's have a look what um, this means. We have again the equation here, same as on the other side. And um, it says the bandwidth and signal to noise ratio are reciprocal to each other, which means if we have a, low, a very low bandwidth, a very high data rate is possible, provided we have a very high signal to noise ratio. Ah, that's um, what we use, and we'll see on the later slides, you have to use a higher order modulation schemes. And if we don't have a high, uh, sorry, if we um, if you don't have a high signal-to-noise ratio, uh, if you have a low signal-to-noise ratio and a high noise, then the data communication is still possible if the bandwidth is high enough, and that's what I just introduced with wideband CDMA and other spread spectrum technologies. So now it's time for the quiz. We wait, and then um, these are the references we have used for the slides. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward that you will also be listening to the second part of the course.